In this session, I'd like to talk about inflation. We all kind of get what inflation is, right? When we ask people to describe inflation, they usually describe it as either a rising level for prices or shrinking purchasing power. The same money doesn't go as far as it used to. But there are subtleties to inflation that we need to understand any time we start delving into how inflation affects us as investors and businesses. First, there is a difference between general inflation and relative inflation. Let me explain. Let's assume that the price of gasoline jumps 25% for whatever reason. Your first reaction, there must be inflation. Not necessarily, because if the price of food drops by 15% when, in, when gas goes up 25%, you might not be paying more overall for the basket of goods and services you get. There's a difference between general inflation and relative inflation. Relative inflation measures how things are priced relative to each other. General inflation looks at how much less you can buy overall with everything built in. In investing in finance, why do we care about inflation? Because inflation eats away at our returns, what we make as businesses, what we make as investors. In fact, I call inflation the hidden tax. It's not called a tax rate, but effectively it accomplishes the same objective. So in this session, I'd like to talk about first how we measure inflation. Then I want to talk about what it is that causes inflation and finally how it plays out in our investing decisions. So let's start with how inflation is measured. First, somebody has to measure inflation. It doesn't measure itself. It's usually a government or a government agency that measures inflation. And to measure inflation, you have to choose a basket of goods and services that you track over time. Now, what goes in that basket? That remains one of the mysteries of inflation, because if that basket is not specified correctly, you could be mismeasuring inflation. Now, when you look at the U.S., there are three broad measures of inflation that you see reported on a regular basis. One is called the Consumer Price Index, or the CPI. That measures inflation at the consumer level what you and I as consumers spend on goods and services, it is perhaps the most tracked inflation number. Right behind it is producer price inflation, which measures changes in prices received by producers of goods and services from the consumers. But it looks at things through the producer's eyes. And finally, there's something called the GDP deflator. That is the number used by the government to convert nominal GDP numbers into real numbers. And that number reflects an, a, a pretty broad measure of inflation for goods and services, but primarily at the domestic level. Now, as you look at those numbers over time, clearly they're going to, be, they're, they're going to move together most of the time, but sometimes they will move differently. And here's why. Remember that basket of goods and services we talked about? That basket of goods and services is set by the service, the entity measuring inflation, and they, they bring their research to bear. They look at what consumers typically spend on housing, on food, to create that basket. And then they track the pricing on that basket. Well, you think that's good. They must get the inflation right, right? Well, one of the problems with that basket is that basket itself is a shifting basket. Why? Because consumers might spend more or less on a good based on prices changing. As an example, in the 1970s, one of the problems that, um, that the, the agencies had measuring inflation was the amount people were spending on gasoline, which was shooting through the roof, was changing as they were tracking inflation. And they kept the weight on how much people spent on how, how much gasoline people were consuming fixed for, for the initial periods which meant that at least initially they were overestimating inflation. They weren't trying to be biased, but it shows up. So the basket of goods and services becomes critical, which means that if different services measure inflation in the same country, you can come up with different measures depending on how that basket is specified. But even within that basket, how you measure pricing can change. Let's take an example. Americans spend a chunk of their income every month on housing. But how they spend it varies. If you're renting your home, you pay it on house rent. But if you're buying your home, you pay it on either what you pay for the home and the mortgage payment that comes out of it. And those are two different, different sets of numbers. You're saying, won't the two move together? Most of the time. But let's say you're in a month where rental, you know, the rent, housing rent jumps, you know, let's say 10%. But housing prices jump only 5%. Which one of those you use as your source for price can give you very diff different inflation numbers. I'm not suggesting that services, again, are doing things wrong. I'm just saying there's a source of error 
no matter how carefully you try to measure inflation. And then there's bias. Why? At least in some parts of the world where governments are in complete charge of measuring inflation, it makes them look good when inflation is low. So by picking a basket of goods and services or measuring inflation at the most favorable level, they can make inflation look low even though it's much higher. Why do they do it? Well, it makes them, as I said, the bias in this process is to give them a number that makes that puts them in a more favorable light. The bottom line is every measure of inflation has noise in it, error in it, and some of them are biased. So let's take a look at the three most broadly used measures of inflation in the US. The CPI, Consumer Price Index, the PPI, the Producer Price Index, and the GDP deflator. Now the CPI and the PPI go back 100 years, so you can see the numbers through time. And the GDP deflator is available for at least half the time period. So if you look across these numbers, the numbers for the most part move together, but there are still big differences across the numbers. In uh, many of the decades, if you look at the numbers, uh, you, you can see that there are some entire some decades where one measure of inflation gives you a very different number than the other. Why, is this, why does that happen? Remember, we talked about how inflation is measured. Is it to the consumer or the producer? What basket of goods? So some of this is just noise in the process. Now, as you look at inflation changing over time, there's a follow-up question. What is it that causes inflation and why is it high in some periods and lower in others? Well, I'm not a monetary economist. I don't want to be one. But broadly speaking, there are three forces that drive inflation. One of the, my favorite expressions I was taught when I was, studi- when I was taught economics is inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. But and while it's a nice way of describing inflation, it doesn't tell you much. Here are the three big forces driving inflation. The first is government spending relative to the inflows that governments have. Put other things remaining equal, large government deficit should lead to more inflation than government surpluses. But even that is nuanced because if you have a lot of government spending in a period where economic growth is low, the effect on inflation is more muted. So the second force is how much is the economy growing? Generally speaking, holding all its constant again, the more economic growth there is, the more pressure there is going to be for inflation to be higher. So government spending matters, real economic growth matters. But ultimately, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. So how much money is being printed makes a big difference. If you're printing money like it's going out of style, inflation will increase over time. In fact, while at low rates of inflation, it's difficult to explain period to period changes in inflation. When inflation becomes uncontrollable, 10%, 15% or 500% hyperinflation, it's almost entirely a monetary phenomenon. How disciplined the central bank is in printing money can affect inflation. Government spending, economic growth, monetary policy. Now, let's bring that to play in why we care. We live in a nominal world. What do I mean by that? Take a look at when you get paid, how you get paid. You get paid in nominal dollars. When you pay taxes, the tax guy doesn't say, tell me what you made in in real terms. It's on nominal income. And finally, when you look at returns you're making on your portfolio, and from you look at your brokerage account and how much money you've made over the previous year, it's in nominal terms. We live in a nominal world. That said, though, inflation does affect how we feel about those nominal returns. A 15% return feels great when inflation rates are only 1% or 2%. But if inflation is 30%, earning a 15% rate of return makes you feel like you're left behind. So one of the things we have to think about is while we live in a nominal world and all the numbers we have are nominal numbers, we have to look at how much inflation affects those numbers. So let's talk about converting nominal returns to real returns. That 15% return that I talked about, how do you convert it from a nominal to a real number? Here's the simplest way to think about nominal returns. A nominal return, if you were <clears throat> if you're in a hurry, you can say it's real return plus inflation. Put simply, if you have a 5% real return and a 10% inflation rate, 5 plus 10 is 15, that's a nominal return. But there's a little compounding effect. Inflation is on top of the real return. You're saying, what does that really mean? Well, to compute your true nominal return, if you wanted to do this right, here's how you'd have to do it. Remember I talked about the 5% real return and the 10% inflation? 
to get the nominal return instead of just adding the 5 to the 10, here's what you're going to do instead. You're going to take 1.05, that's 1 plus the 5%, times 1.10, that's 1 plus the 10%. You're going to take the product of those two. And what's it going to give you? It's going to give you a number slightly higher than 15%, maybe closer to 16%. Most of the time when inflation is low and real returns are low, you can just add numbers up. But in general, if you want to do this right, you have to take the compounded view. <clears throat> so let's suppose I gave you a nominal return and asked you to convert to a real return. Here's all you need to do. You take 1 plus the nominal return, 15%, 1.15. And if your inflation rate is 5%, you're going to divide the 1.15 by 1.05. Subtract out 1. You come up with a real return of just over 9%. Converting nominal to real returns is a skill we all need to have. <clears throat> because as I said, even though we earn nominal returns, ultimately we get to keep real returns. So here's what I did. I went back to 1929 and I got returns on US stocks every year. These are nominal returns. So you see the green line? Those are my nominal returns every year. Every year, I also netted out the inflation effect, doing what I just showed you to get a real return each year. So I have, if, if you look at the total time period, 1929 through 2019, 90 years of nominal returns, 90 years of real returns. You see, the two graphs look like they're very close to each other. Why do we even bother? In fact, if I report the annual returns, for, the mo for most decades, the numbers are pretty close. For instance, if you look at the last 20 years, your nominal returns and your real returns are very close. You're saying, why are we wasting our time then? But take a look at the 1970s. 1970s, when inflation was much higher, you can see the big divergence between nominal and real returns. But even if the, differ <coughs> if the difference every year is only 2 or 3%, which is what it's been in the U.S. for much of the 90 years, the cumulated effect of inflation is much larger than it seems to be. Let me explain. If you'd invested $100 in stocks at the end of 1928 and held all the way through 2019, $100, you know, one zero zero. you know how much that, that would be worth? Be worth more than $500,000. That's a pure power of compounding kick in. $100 over a 91-year time period would have been worth $500,000 plus. You think this is great, but those are in nominal terms. If I would taken the $100 and looked at what I'd have left over after inflation over that same time period, the $100 invested in real terms would have delivered only about $33,000. Now do you see why I call inflation the hidden tax? You didn't even see it coming, but you've lost a huge chunk of that $502,000 because of inflation. I'm not saying we should think in real terms, but in a sense, you always have to think about inflation when you think about investing because inflation is going to take a bite out of your returns. Now, one final point before inflation, before we put this topic to rest. When we talk about investing, when we talk about business, not only are our returns going to be nominal in real terms, when we talked about how to do the conversion, often the cash flows were given. Let's hear a business and I say, You'll make $100 every year for the next five years. Or you have a contract where you're going to make $5 million every year for the next 10 years. Those are nominal cash flows. To convert the nominal cash flow into real cash flow, I do exactly what I did with nominal returns. I take the nominal cash flow and I take out the inflation rate. And the further into the future it happens, the more inflation is going to eat away at my nominal cash flow. This, is, this looks a lot like discounting, and one reason we do discounting to come up with present value is to factor in inflation, but this is a pure inflation effect. If you gave me a nominal growth rate, which is what most of us think in terms of, right? So when I tell you that my company is going to, going to grow at 10% a year for the next 10 years, I am giving you a nominal growth rate. Your job, if you want to convert it into a real growth rate, if you want to take the shortcut is to subtract out the inflation rate. The inflation rate is 2%, 10 minus 2 is 8% real growth rate. Or if you want to do it right again, bring in the compounding effect. 10% nominal growth rate, 2% inflation. You take 1.10 divided by 1.02 minus 1. What will that give you? It'll give you a real growth rate less than 8%. That's a compounding effect. So let's summarize. Inflation is a fact of life. In fact, later in, this, in, a, in, in a couple of sessions, we're going to talk about currencies. It's more of a fact of life in high inflation currencies and lower, but in every currency, it is a fact of life. 
we have to be comfortable moving with the, between real and nominal. And we have to remember that even though nominal returns can look good in a high inflation environment, it's real returns that come. So get comfortable moving from nominal to real with returns, cash flows, and growth rates. It's a skill that you will draw on, whether you're an investor or a business person. So in the next session, we will move on to interest rates, but you will see it build of what we've just talked about in terms of inflation. Thank you.